Again, we're looking at a fairly long passage of scripture this morning, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, if you were watching online before, as the Zoom call was just beginning, it ran as text on the screen. We'll be talking about a portion of it, um, specifically Revelation 19 verses 11 to 16. I'll mention a few things in the other parts of Revelation 19. And then let me encourage you to come back this evening or to join us this evening by way of Zoom for the Bible study where we're going to get into more of the details of the things that are being talked about here. I'll tantalize you just a little bit because I've had a few people asking me for months now, what about the thousand years? When do we get to the thousand years? Well, we get there tonight. We won't deal with it in depth tonight, but we will arrive there and see it within its context because the first three verses of Revelation chapter 20 belong very firmly with the part of Revelation that we see or the vision of Christ that we see in Revelation chapter 19. So I won't be reading the whole scripture, but I do want to again sort of step back and consider where we are because way back in Advent, of 2017, we began a series on the gospel according to Luke with the idea that that would go from Luke to Acts and to Revelation. So we've been sort of working through this under the heading of this same Jesus since December of 2017. And that's a reference to Acts chapter 1, verse 11, which in some translations reads, This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And all along the way, in the gospel according to Luke, in the book of Acts, and now in the book of Revelation, we have been seeing portraits of Jesus. In the Gospel according to Luke, we saw Jesus in what the Westminster Larger Catechism calls the state or the estate of Christ's humiliation. In the book of Acts, we saw Jesus incarnate once again in his body, the church. The book starts off, or many books, many Bibles say the Acts of the Apostles. In reality, it wasn't the Acts of the Apostles. It was the Acts of of Christ Jesus working through the Holy Spirit to empower his church so that he could carry on with the work that the Father had given him to do. At the end of the Gospel of John, Jesus breathed on his disciples and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. But then he went on to say, as the Father sent me into the world, I am sending you. And so the book of Acts is not to be distinguished from the Gospels. It is part of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. It is Luke part two, if you want. But we see Jesus in his state of humiliation in the Gospel of Luke, to a certain extent even in the book of the Acts, because in Acts we're seeing Jesus at work through frail and fallible human beings. But not quite as much as we maybe did in Luke, because in Luke chapter 1, for instance, we considered Jesus the embryo. Remember? The angel said, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And I think that gets at the very heart of what Paul was writing about, and we'll come back to this text through the sermon today, in Philippians chapter 2, when he spoke of Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Because before Jesus was a baby in the arms of his mother Mary, Jesus was an embryo in her womb. The incarnation happened not in a manger in Bethlehem, as if that wasn't humiliation enough to be laid in a trough that had been designed for the feeding of animals, but rather the incarnation happened when the Lord of glory, by whom all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones and dominions or rulers and authorities, when the Lord of glory became a single cell in the womb of a Nazarene peasant girl. Now, of course, an embryo really is a baby, just a very, very small baby. And if you ever find yourself in an argument with someone who claims to be a Christian, especially, 
but also says that life doesn't begin at conception, here is where the argument ends. When you point out that the unborn John the Baptist, already filled with the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit doesn't fill blobs of tissue, he fills people. And when you point out that the unborn John the Baptist leaped for joy in his mother's womb when the unborn Jesus entered, carried in the womb of his mother. Point made. There is no argument. There is no discussion. There is no other way of interpreting this. Life begins at conception. Jesus entered this world as an embryo when he was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Now later he was born in Bethlehem of Judea as had been written by the prophet Micah under circumstances that were somewhat less regal than one might have expected for the Lord of heaven and earth. Being brought to Jerusalem some years later, after which time he went back to Nazareth, and once again, the Lord of glory, as a 12-year-old boy, was submissive to his parents for the next 15 or 20 years, while he increased in wisdom and stature. These are pictures of Jesus in his estate of humiliation, and even at the commencement of his public ministry, he humbled himself, accepting baptism to fulfill all righteousness from one who, by his own words, had need to be baptized by Jesus. And of course, there were numerous incidents throughout his life when he was, in the words of the prophet Isaiah, despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief as one from whom men hide their faces. So going back to Philippians 2, we are told that after he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men, Jesus then humbled himself even further. He humbled himself even further by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And the Heidelberg Catechism characterizes all of this by saying that during his whole life on earth, don't miss that part, during his whole life on earth, but especially at the end, Christ sustained in body and soul the anger of God against the sin of the whole human race. All of this, of course, is the Jesus with whom we are most familiar. We have heard stories. We have heard sermons from the Gospels throughout our lives. We have had this Jesus set before us, often as a preeminent example of humanity. We have been encouraged to live as he lived. Some have even walked around, maybe not so much now, but some years ago, with a little bracelet that said WWJD, what would Jesus do? And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Even the passage that we've referenced this morning from Philippians chapter 2 begins with the statement, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. We are to have the mind of Christ. We are to live as he lived. We are to love as he loved. This is because we now are still in an estate of humiliation, just as he was in an estate of humiliation then. But here's the thing, here's the point. For him, that was then. Jesus is no longer an embryo or a baby or a precocious student astounding the rabbis with the depth of his questions, or a newly minted rabbi himself in need of baptism. Nor is Jesus a suffering servant bleeding out on a Roman cross. Never ever imagine Jesus still on that cross. It should go completely without saying, but that was then. That was Jesus in the state of humiliation. But the text that we've referenced from Philippians 2 tells us that because Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death on a cross, therefore, because he humbled himself, God has highly exalted him. 
and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, the humiliation, that was then. It happened. It happened in history, in time and space. And because it happened in history, it came to an end. The writer to the Hebrews tells us that Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that was set before him, that is his exaltation, that was the joy that was set before him. And for that, he endured the cross, despising the shame, that was then, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is now. By way of analogy, I want you to think of any other person in Scripture, Old or New Testament, it doesn't matter. Think of King David, for instance. We, we know some things about his life. We know that he too was from the region of Bethlehem. We know that he was a shepherd who became a king. The Scriptures reveal some things about David's life, but that was then. Where is he now? Well, we don't know precisely. Scripture doesn't say. What we do know is he is not in Bethlehem or in Jerusalem or in the wilderness of En Gedi or fighting giants in the Valley of Elah, and we would not expect to find him there, nor should we expect to find Jesus in a manger. This whole business of Advent, let's journey to the manger and find the baby Jesus. No, no. We don't find Jesus in a manger. We don't find him walking the roads of Galilee or dying on a cross. That was then. This is now. And what we are seeing in this kind of ultimate portrait of Jesus in Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse 11, this is now. John writes, then I saw heaven opened. Note the scene. This happens over and over again in the book. If you've been in the Bible study, we've been trying to highlight that. He keeps coming back after judgment to seeing heaven opened. And here he sees heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and in True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. John saw him that way in Revelation chapter 1 as well. And on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure. That's, that's us. We're following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I don't want to be guilty of adding to the words of this prophecy. Revelation 22:18 says that's a bad thing. If anyone adds to the words of this prophecy, God will add to him all of the plagues that are described in this book. So I don't want to be guilty of that, but if I can borrow a few words from earlier in chapter 19, the parts that we're going to be considering tonight in more detail, maybe it's not bad. After that statement, on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. To borrow those words from higher up in the passage and add, forever and ever, amen, hallelujah. Because this is now. Then, Christ humbled himself and became obedient on a cross. Now God has highly exalted him 
and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Then he came to Jerusalem humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a beast of burden. Now he comes with power and great glory, mounted on a war horse and ready to strike down the nations and to rule them with a rod of iron. And this is that transition between what we've seen, the judgment of the apostate, faithless bride, moving from that which happened in A.D. 70 into that thousand years moving into the time where Christ is reigning at the right hand of the Father over the nations, ruling them with a rod of iron as he does today. This is the point, and it has always been the point. We have occasionally been guilty of saying, I think I've probably said it myself somewhere along the way, that Jesus was born to die. Sometimes we dress it up a little. We say, he was born to die that we might live. We, we sing that, which is true. But it's only true to a certain point, so we can't stop there. He was born to die, but he was also born to reign. What was the estate of Christ's humiliation? The Westminster Larger Catechism tells us the estate of Christ's humiliation was that low condition wherein he, for our sake, emptying himself of his glory, took upon him the form of a servant in his conception and birth, life, death, and after his death, until, a very important word there, until his resurrection. But what was the estate of Christ's exaltation? The estate of Christ's exaltation comprehendeth his resurrection. It started there, his ascension, his sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and his coming again to judge the world. And we see that in his coming again to judge the faithless bride here in the book of Revelation. So here we have a portrait of Jesus. Not in his humiliation, a portrait of Jesus in his exaltation. We have a portrait of Jesus as he has been since his resurrection and ascension to the right hand of the Father, which is where we find him. In Revelation 19, verse 11, we read, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Now we'll come back to the name in a moment. But it's still significant to the next statement too. We know that this is Jesus. It doesn't use the word Jesus, but we know that it is Jesus because he is called Faithful and True. He named himself such in chapter 3, verse 14 when he spoke to the church at Laodicea, saying the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. And he was so named in John's benediction in chapter 1, where John said, Grace to you and peace from him who was, was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Even so, this is Jesus Christ, And he is mounted on this white horse, and he has come in righteousness to judge and to make war. And we should anticipate from the start then that this is not going to end well for those who have conspired to make war against him. They're named further down in the chapter, the beast and the kings of the land with their armies and the false prophet. We find that in verses 19 and 20. The one who judges and makes war in righteousness has come against those who thought to make war against him. As Malachi wrote, who can endure the day of his coming or who can stand when he appears for he is like a refiner's fire. In fact, according to both testaments of scripture, our God is a consuming fire. It's interesting, I don't hear that one so much 
There's one place in the New Testament where the Apostle John says, God is love, and that's true. And I hear that one all the time, everywhere I go. But here, in the book of Hebrews, the writer to the Hebrews, in chapter 12, verse 29, quotes Moses, who said, Our God is a consuming fire, and those two things are not incompatible. And when Jesus came to judge the adulterous bride that we've been looking at for three weeks now, he very much came in this mode, judging and making war in holiness and in the righteousness of God. We see it further in verse 12 where we are told his eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. And aside from being the source of probably a favorite hymn for a lot of people, crown him with many crowns. This verse not only points to the majesty, it points to the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've seen him described as having eyes like a flame of fire on more than one occasion, eyes that burn, eyes that penetrate. But these are the eyes of God. In Psalm 34, verses 15 and 16, we are told the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. So that penetrating gaze, those eyes like a flame, are watching over his people and his ears hear them when they cry out. But in the same way, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, as here in Revelation 19, when he comes in righteousness to judge and make war. Now verse 12, it's up on the screen there, also says he has a name written that no one knows but himself. And I was sorely tempted in light of that to just say, hey, you want to know more about that? Come back tonight. I'll make a little plug um, and just leave it right there and not talk about it. But I knew that that was probably not fair. It says he has a name written that no one knows but himself, and yet we see several names written right here in our text. He is called faithful and true in verse 11, and and he's called the word of God in verse 13, and in verse 16, on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is one of those things in Revelation, there are a few places like this where commentators, for some bizarre reason, like to speculate. And some have speculated about some sort of secret name, the secret name of Jesus. And honest to goodness, if there is a secret name, there's really no point in the speculation. All I can say is ask him when you see him. Um, And that probably won't be the first thing on your mind at that time. But a more likely answer comes in this. It's in the word no, as it's used not only here, but in other places in Scripture. It's often used in a more possessive sense. Now, here's an example. Like when Joseph took Mary to be his wife and knew her not until after she had given birth to Jesus. Okay, well, that's not saying that Joseph had no cognitive knowledge of his wife Mary. He certainly did. He accompanied her from Nazareth to Bethlehem. He knew her in that sense of knowing her as a person, knowing probably by that time, her likes and dislikes and a lot of other information about her, but he did not know her in the biblical sense. He did not possess her as his wife in the physical sense until after she had given birth to Jesus. So Joseph knew her not until some time later when presumably he did. And the author here is not saying that this is a name no one can know, cognitively know what it is. I believe that he is saying it is a name that only Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, could possess as his own. 
so we can know what it is. It is the name by which he was known, written down for us here when he shared the glory of the Father before the world began. He is called the Word of God. But it's also the name that is above every name that is given him by the Father in his exaltation for the throne. And that too is written for us right here in this portrait of Jesus. For on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So John's not saying we can't know that that's what he's called. We certainly can know that that's what he is called. John is just saying no one else can know the meaning of that name or possess the meaning of that name. No one else will ever be. No one else ever was King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And for the rest, if the Lord is willing, we'll deal with this in far more detail, a Bible study, um, far more than what we can do here this morning, including the capture of the beast and the false prophet coming up after Jesus goes forth riding on the white horse and their subsequent condemnation to everlasting destruction. And we will have a preliminary look at the binding of Satan for a thousand years, which is clearly connected to the things that we've already considered. Remember, no chapter breaks, no verse numbers, not even capital letters in the Greek manuscripts of God's word. So as you're reading from chapter 19 and into chapter 20, don't let that great big black 20 make you think, oh, stop, change of subject. Since Revelation chapter 12, we have seen three really bad actors. The dragon who was introduced to us in Revelation 12 and the two beasts, one from the land, one from the sea. The beast from the land is alternatively known later in the book as the false prophet. And all three of those, the beast, from the sea, the beast from the land, and the dragon himself. They are the ones who have stood in opposition against the Lord Jesus and against the church since, well, through the whole book, but especially since Revelation chapter 11. So as Jesus, in this ultimate portrait of who he is, goes forth conquering and to conquer on this white horse, who does he conquer? The beast, the false prophet, and the dragon. Those three, the same beast, the same false prophet, and the same dragon that we've been looking at through the latter part of this book. And, and, and hopefully tonight I can make that even a little bit more clear for those who participate in the Bible study. And what about us? Where does this picture leave us? Recognizing that this is Jesus going forth on this war horse to bring judgment on that apostate bride that we've seen in chapter 16, 17, and 18. Where does that leave us? Well, we could skip to the end if we wanted to, because this whole book now balances at this point between the false bride who's being destroyed and the true bride. One of the angels in chapter 21 will say to John, come, let me show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb, which in Scripture is always the church. And then he will take John away in the Spirit, and he will show him the holy city, the heavenly Jerusalem, also identified in Hebrews chapter 12 with the church of Jesus Christ. He will show him that holy city coming down out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. So we're seeing this flip between the judgment of the old and the coming of the new. But we'll save that for a couple of weeks from now. And for today, for this morning, since we're talking about the name of Jesus, I want to close by going back to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. I've already read it a couple of times. I'm going to read it again. We have considered this morning the humility of our Savior in the Incarnation. That was then. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped then, but emptied himself. <laughs> 
by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself then by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. But that was then. And because Jesus was willing to give himself for us and for our salvation, verse 9 of Philippians chapter 2, therefore God has highly exalted him. That's now. Paul's not saying because Jesus humbled himself then and stayed humbled, then someday God's going to exalt him. Paul is saying because he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. And this too is our calling. So that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In fact, King of kings and Lord of lords. And we are called to confess that. We are called to worship him. This is the mission of the church. And we are called to do so to the glory of God. His Father, and now in him, our Father, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your Spirit would show us and what your Spirit would say through your holy word to your church this morning. Help us to comprehend with the eyes of faith Jesus, risen, ascended, reigning, right now at your right hand, overcoming all of his enemies and ours, ruling until all of his enemies have been made a footstool for his feet, ruling until that last enemy, death, is utterly and finally defeated in the resurrection of the dead at which time he surrenders his kingdom back to you, that you may be all and in all. Lord, help us to see with the eyes of faith and give us grace to worship the one who is seated on the throne, before whom angels and saints and living creatures bow 24 hours a day, seven days a week to proclaim holy Holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty. The whole earth is full of your glory. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Christ, our glory.